Have you ever thought to yourself, what's the best thing that can happen? Or what's the worst thing can, that can happen? That's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what if it's wonderful. Let's keep calm and mother on. Mothering is way too important to do alone and way too serious to be serious all the time. My name is Christy Thomas, and I am here shoulder to shoulder with you, mothering and enjoying life together. This is the podcast where you can focus on being mindful and taking a deep breath with me and learning new things so you can pause and savor the amazing life you already have. Now let's go. Today, I'm very excited to bring Nicole Zazowski. Did I say that right? That's a good you Polish did. That best was name. Impressive. Very okay. good. <laughs> she wrote the book, What If It's Wonderful? And I recently read it and I knew that I needed to bring her on. Um, shout out, by the way, she reads the book as the audiobook. <laughs> so if you're an audiobook fan, it's always fun to have the author read it to you. It's like story time. Welcome, Nicole. (laughs) Oh, it's so fun to be with you, friend. I'm excited. So I loved the title of the book and the the cover. That's why I picked it up. I really knew nothing about what it was going to be. Just that, you know, here in 2022, it's a question. What if it's wonderful? What if it all turns out okay? Or what if we can celebrate what's happening? Why did you write this book? Let's learn a little bit about you. Yeah, you know, a lot of people see confetti on the cover and they think, you know, I must have had a lot to say about joy and celebration because it came so naturally to me. (laughs) (laughs) And the truth is this season or this book was born much more out of a season of Uh, change and loss and um, really hard things in my life. And, you know, when you go through a painful season, whether that's a loss, like the loss of a loved one or a betrayal or just a season that turns out really differently than you thought or hoped it would, there's the loss, there's what happened, and then there's the cost. And the cost is the impact to our sense of identity and our sense of safety and security. And what took me a really long time to realize about the cost of my own season of heartache was that when I did start stepping into a different kind of season that was characterized by more joy and breakthrough in our story, I realized that my joy was accompanied by a lot of fear. And I was living very protected. It felt easier and and safer and many times maybe even more responsible to to not hold that joy at all (laughs) than to hold something that might break. Um, And then, you know, practicing this way of living for a long time, this very protected way of living, I woke up one morning and I realized, yeah, I have lost some big things in my story. But a lot of the loss I've experienced is not only the loss itself, but my refusal to to hold joy and embrace the life that I've been given. And I thought, I am done missing out on my beautiful God-given life because I am so busy preparing for the worst. And so that sent me into a deep dive um, on neuroscience research (laughs) and scripture and evaluating my own story uh, to really understand what joy and celebration is at its best. That is, um, we have a lot of parallels with our Mm -hmm. stories of finding joy and embracing it in motherhood in particular. Right. Because a big part of your season, which is it's infertility week while we're recording this. And Mm -hmm. and that's a big untalked about loss for a lot of women. One in eight, I think, struggle with it. Yes. No. And whether it's infertility or multiple miscarriages, uh, my husband and I have a diagnosis that Uh, makes it more likely than not for us to lose that baby to miscarriage when we do conceive. And so there's a a lot of waiting and you want to hope and you're wondering if it's going to hurt more if you let yourself Mm -hmm. hope. And um, yeah, just the, the, 
cumulative effect of five losses in so many years. Yeah. Um, and it just makes it harder to rise to that delight and hope in your day. Um, Absolutely. When you've been knocked down. So I have a ton of compassion for that story, whatever that story has looked like for you. Yeah, there's just a space, right, where that loss from one time to five times just knocks you down in a way that people can't describe. So when you write about being able to celebrate now that you see this amazing life, you found yourself in a story that you have kids and you were able to move forward. How do you hold the hope yeah. when you're in that space? I had to get there before my story changed, <laughs> um, which uh, A, is important because, you know, if you're listening or, or if you read the book and um, for a long time, I saw celebration and joy even as something sitting on the other side of the realization of a dream or the achievement of a goal or some sort of change in my circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I realized how disempowering that was um, and how anxious it would make me as I walked into a transition, whether that was a transition in our personal lives or even a transition like a new year where mm -hmm. there's a lot of talk of, you know, <laughs> what, let's celebrate what's going to yeah. happen this year and uh, a lot of goals and dreams and vision casting. And I would just be so anxious thinking, well... I hope I have a reason to celebrate in this <laughs> next season or this next year. And really what the, the neuroscience research says and what scripture says is that celebration is much more of a rhythm than it is a reaction to good news or a reward for an accomplishment. It's a rhythm that's available to all of us that we can practice in our lives now that help us glean more joy in the lives we are already living. And celebration doesn't always look like a party. I talk about a lot of very small daily practices mm -hmm. in my book that um, are doable. <laughs> and uh, if you're not a big party planner, that's fine. Uh, I, I am not. That is not the skill set uh, for everyone, for sure. <laughs> nope, nope. I love my celebratory friends who do have that skill set, but don't feel limited by that. Um, really, it's these are small everyday practices that that change our thinking yeah. and therefore change the way we engage with our loved ones in our life. So really, celebration is a discipline to develop, right? It's it's something you have to build a muscle for. Um, yes. And at first, I was quite annoyed by that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, gosh, darn it. Why, why does celebration have to be something that also requires hard work and discipline and practice? And then, like I said, I realized how incredibly hopeful and empowering that was that I didn't have to wait for some shift that was out of my control, mm -hmm. that this was something that was available to me now that actually really makes a big difference. Is there one of those discipline practices, something that you started with that was really early on that was like your gateway practice that you could share with us? Yeah, uh, I love your term of gateway practice. I, I call it my on-ramp, so similar, yeah. similar uh, term. But um, it's my favorite one to talk about for a couple reasons. Uh, it's, it's called savoring. And the reason I love to talk about this is there's a few things going on in the brain that left on neutral, our brain makes our brain go negative. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> if we, all we have to do to feel hopeless and despairing and disappointed is nothing. <laughs> that's, <laughs> right. That's the that's brain's the default. Brain, yeah. Yes. Unfortunately. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. Uh, there's something called the hedonic treadmill going on in our brain. Okay. Um, and this is a phenomenon that basically means that we rapidly adapt to joy. So that gift or that news that make made you think I would want for nothing else if I received it mm -hmm. um, quickly fades into the background. And maybe it's still a good thing in your life, but that thrill and excitement has worn off. Gotcha. Um, 
And then our brains are stickier with negative (laughs) information and painful things. Um, I always say our our brains are like Velcro for Mm -hmm. pain and Teflon for joy. Um, And then we have this horrible habit of telling our joy how it can be improved upon. (laughs) Um, So Mother's Day is coming up. That's a good example. Yes. You have a great day with your family. You feel celebrated. They do some special things and you feel really known and have some good connections with each of your family members. Mm -hmm. And you're laying in bed at night and you start to think, well, it would have been better if we did this. (laughs) Or it would have been better if that would have been a better compliment versus this, or they said this, but they didn't say that, you know? Yep. The and, things and, that we're missing or goodness gracious, if you picked up your phone and saw someone else's celebration and yes, that it comparison. looked better than yours. Yes. Comparison is unhelpful to this dynamic in our brain. So I say all that to just paint a picture of what our, our neutral starting place is. Um, And savoring helps us celebrate the ordinary. So what it does is it takes an ordinary moment. And I'm thinking snapshot here, like small thing. I had a friend who just wanted to savor the fact she has four teenagers Mm -hmm. and she just wanted to savor the fact that her and her husband and her four kids were all sitting down at the dinner table together. Oh, absolutely. Um, That's a huge deal with the teenage schedules. Yes, yes. (laughs) And it's so rare. And I'm sure it wasn't a perfect dinner in terms of the food, or maybe there was some squabbles or whatever. But just the fact that they were all sitting down at the same time was something she wanted to savor. So think really small. And the way that you practice this is you just ask your five traditional senses what they're going to remember about that moment. So what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? And what do you feel? And that helps you celebrate that moment that your brain would be tempted to dismiss as unimportant and helps you carry it forward in a way that it can actually bring you joy, even when you recall it later. Yeah, it's it's like activating your inner video camera for it, right? Yes. To like really cement it in. Yes. Yeah. And there's something about engaging all five senses that I have found so helpful um, because I think we, a lot of us, not, not all of us um, tend to rely a lot on sight. Yes. Um, yes. Because we always have an answer for what we're seeing. But even when I, I do this a lot, um, my daughter's 15 months old and I just love holding her, Mm -hmm. you know, late at night when her body's really limp and heavy and (laughs) she's so sleepy and resting on my chest and I can hear her little snuggle snorts as she's kind of drifting off to sleep. But taste is not a sense that I would typically engage in that moment. You know, I love her baby smell. I love the feel, but, but taste is not something I would typically naturally engage with, but just to reflect on it anyway, like, Oh, it's, it's usually the taste of old coffee in my mouth. (laughs) I was going to say that or toothpaste, right? That maybe you've brushed your teeth. (laughs) One of the two, hopefully the toothpaste, that would be better. (laughs) Um, but that helps cement it in my memory in a different way than if I had just focused on the obvious. That is an amazing practice. And I love that it's something that just requires you to like take a breath and be present to the ordinary moment. So even in a painful season, right? Like you can still Mm -hmm. celebrate ordinary moments that you're living in. Yeah, I have yet to encounter a season since I started practicing this. Um, and obviously, because of the publishing process being so long, I've, I've been at this a couple of years. Um, and I, I have yet to see a season where this was not extraordinarily helpful to me um, and didn't extract more joy, even in the midst of acknowledging what's painful and, and really hurting Um, This is not about blind optimism or um, expecting what is good to cancel when it's hard. It's about noticing both sitting together. Right. They're side by side. We don't have to embrace toxic positivity or whatever we're calling it nowadays, right? Yeah, exactly. 
We have both in our lives, pain mm-hmm. and joy. Mm-hmm. Well, are you teaching these practices to your oldest son? How old is your oldest right now? Are you My embracing this? Six. Uh, yeah, he. So in in certain ways, um, occasionally I will do this with him. Um, also, you know, the, the research is pretty clear that for kids, the most powerful thing mm-hmm. is when we regulate ourselves. When, um, <laughs> yep. when, so usually I use this, I'm a therapist, and usually I use this in the context of, you know, parent emotional regulation yeah. when we feel like we're going off the rails to just regulate ourselves out loud. But I think there's also room and that same principle applies mm-hmm to how we engage with life, not when we're feeling off the rails, but how we engage with life in our joy. If you think it, say it. <laughs> um, I, I was just, one of the most surprising things I found in my research um, was around the topic of Thanksgiving. Okay. Um, and this speaks to, to what you just shared. Um, because gratitude is such a common conversation, especially in recent years. Yes. And I love that. The research is clear. Gratitude does increase our joy. It Mm -hmm. makes a huge difference because it helps us notice and name what is good. What I didn't realize until I started researching was that Thanksgiving actually expressing out loud the gratitude that we feel in our heart yeah. doubles the joy that we glean from gratitude. Whoa. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Yeah. So there is benefit. I am not poo-pooing. You know, if you have a gratitude journal or you right. like to name three good things at the end of each day, I think that's a beautiful practice. If you want to throw gasoline on your joy, yeah. if there's any of those things that you can say thank you for, even to God in your prayers, um, you know, if it's something in nature or, you know, it's been a wonderful way to connect with God in the light of my joy through my prayers. Yeah. But also just taking the time, if there's a person in my life to not just feel grateful for them, but to say, here's what I love about you. Yeah. And here's the difference your presence makes in my life. And here's how I've grown and changed because of our friendship or, you know, I do. So to answer your question, yeah, I do this with, I try and do this with my kids very specifically. Like, here's why my life's better because you're in it. Um, and specifically I try to reference how God made them mm-hmm. in terms of their personality or their gifting and, and do it differently with each of my kids. Um, so I think more, Yes, teaching our kids to do it, but also modeling it yeah. and letting them experience the joy of that. Yeah, modeling is way more sticky, mm-hmm. right? Then, then doing it, showing them is always better than um, just telling. telling. Yeah. yeah. So is there, sometimes we're really good at comforting others, and not mm-hmm. celebrating with others. So if you know someone is going through a hard time, it seems easy to comfort them and bring them the bowl of soup and send them the text message. But it seems a little bit harder to celebrate with people. How do we celebrate? Yeah, this um, I get this question a lot from people. Um, and, and sadly, I think it's true. <laughs> I think we do have a harder time engaging with people in their joy, particularly when it steps on the toes of a dream that we would love to have for Mm -hmm. ourselves. So um, I think it's a little bit easier if, if we're being really honest. I think most people find it a little bit easier when it feels like, oh, great that that's going on in your life. Uh, it, it's not a dream that I have, mm-hmm. but when it's something that we're waiting for and longing for and our friend gets to experience a breakthrough or a celebration in that same area, it can be really hard. And I don't, uh, I think it's important to find a safe place to process yeah. that pain. Um, and because that's real. And, and I, I know that when, I was 
having five miscarriages, for example, in the midst of a season where all of my friends were having babies. That's very hard. (laughs) Yeah. To cry about that. Um, and I think where, when, when it comes to rejoicing with those who rejoice and mourning with those who mourn, I, I think that we miss out on a lot of joy when we're not able to do both together. It can be a very isolating experience if we think, well, I'm celebrating, but I don't want to hurt somebody else. So Mm -hmm. I'm just going to stay quiet. And our tendency, if we're mourning and somebody else is celebrating, is to stay quiet because we don't want to rain on their parade or be a downer. And that isolation um, and loneliness uh, is much more disconnecting and way less joyful than if we, in the right friendships, Mm -hmm. um, just just said it and and said, I want to join you in your joy and here's what's going on with me. And I'd love your comfort in my pain or vice versa. There's a lot of joy glean when we do both together. Um, but the, the Bible verse or story that really kicked my tail on this one <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was the story of Moses um, right before the Israelites were to enter the promised land. And of course we know he'd been their fearless leader all Mm -hmm. those years, um, obviously following God, but, but the Israelites leader through the wilderness, but because he had disobeyed God earlier in that journey, he was told he wasn't going to be the one to lead God's people into the promised land and he wasn't going to get to enter it. And he goes up on this mountain and scripture says they are so close to the promised land. He can actually see it in the distance. And I love his honesty. He pleads with God one more time. Can I please be the one? And I don't like to psychologize scripture, but (laughs) it is hard to understand. It's hard to ignore that God's language is very strong. He gives an emphatic no And he also says, this is the end of the discussion. We're not talking about this anymore. Almost like an adolescent conversation. (laughs) And, um, but what I'm really challenged by is what God says next. He says, I want you to commission Joshua. I want you to pour courage into him for the dream that you would love to have for yourself. Uh, And I'm paraphrasing there, but What that taught me is I think that when other people experience joy that we would love to have, I think our tendency is to find a way to be okay with it and to accept it. Yeah. Um, And often the way that we do this is, you know, well, she has that, but I have this. And it sort of becomes this. It's a tit for tat judging comparison thing. Yeah. Comparison, competition, Like we're trying to balance the ledger any way we can. Mm -hmm. And I love this story because there's an active component to that celebration that Moses was called to help prepare Joshua. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think we are called to stuff our friend's backpack for the journey, whether that's um, making a connection that might really help them or... Uh, physically bringing a bouquet of flowers over to help them celebrate, you know, what, whatever that looks like in the situation, there is this active component. And every time I have done this, that practice has changed my heart. I think we often feel like we have to feel like doing something in order to do it. Like we wait to, for the feeling mm-hmm. to, to inspire the action. Right. And that's the biggest pushback I get with clients is, you know, I just don't feel it. Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I really understand that. I feel the same way. I really wish that actions followed feelings, but more often than not, feelings follow actions. And so there's something about practicing that celebration that really shifts my heart in a really beautiful way had I simply privately found a way to try to be okay with it. I... Love that, Mm. that, that action taking first is that bold connection piece, especially as someone that's moved around a lot, right? And you're just meeting people where they are and hoping that they see you and connect with you. 
that it yeah. always, life always requires action before you're ready for the good yeah. things. Yeah, no. And I, you know, I think that, that owning truth can point us toward new practices. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think it's new practices that really help us embody that truth and trust that it's true. Um, versus just keeping that truth in our head. Yeah. Well, where, let me think about how to say this. What is your most recent celebration? What is something you're most proud of through this whole process of your book and everything? Hmm. Um, always, well, I haven't done it that many times. So. <laughs> <laughs> Always might be a strong word. Um, but my favorite for both books I've written, my favorite part is uh, just hearing how people are engaging with the material um, and different situations that I, uh, not that I'm surprised that this topic speaks to, but that I hadn't necessarily thought of. Yeah. Um, as I was writing the book, either because it's a story that's really different than mine or um, a situation that I wasn't sure how this topic was going to relate to. Um, And it's been really, really beautiful. Actually, a population I've heard a lot from is moms. Yeah. Um, And and celebrating um, in the midst of parenting and motherhood looking really different than they thought it would. Um, yep. whether that's parenting a child with special needs or whether that's, oh, I thought I would like being a mom more than I do most days. And how can I practice yeah. celebration and joy, um, in the life that I have and glean more joy from that. So I, that is, that's been so fun for me to hear those testimonials and, I really celebrate what God is doing through the words he gave me um, that's beyond what I could have imagined. That's fantastic. Well, I celebrate with you. And if you want to listen, the audiobook is so much fun. As you can hear, Nicole's voice is soothing. And I love when she's reading it and you can tell she's excited about what you're reading at that moment. Like it mm-hmm. felt like we were in that moment with you. So I was, I loved I loved reading the audiobook. It was I did feel like I was reading it to to potential readers and um I really believe in this message and that these are stories that maybe aren't aren't the big um they're they're not not all of them are big, you know, momentous stories, but they're everyday stories that have really really changed my life. So it was fun to get to read it out loud. Well, I'm so excited. Where can people find your book, Nicole? Yes. Again, it's called What If It's Wonderful? And it's about finding the courage to celebrate. Uh, You could certainly get it on Amazon um, or your local bookstore could, I'm sure, order it for you (laughs) if you don't have it. Um, And then my website's a great place to interact with me. um, And you can download a ton of really awesome freebies that accompany the book. Uh, You know those conversation cards that come in those acrylic yeah. boxes, like table topics. Mm-hmm. So I did a printable version of oh, those me. Uh, for your celebrations, whether it's just with your family or a larger gathering or a Bible study book club. Um, and they are totally free and printable. And that's just one example of, of one thing that accompanies the book. Um, and then the social media platform I hang out the most is Instagram. And I'm just at Nicole Zazowski there. Absolutely. I definitely reached out to you there to help yes. connect for this. Um, yes. Instagram is great for celebrating and connecting with people. So yeah, it's a great place to practice a lot of things in the book. <laughs> absolutely. And I think that was one of my favorite parts of the book that a lot of the stuff that you talked about weren't. They weren't like once in a lifetime moments, right? Yeah. Like they were yeah. just pretty ordinary, gritty moments that most of us yeah. are going to experience, um, which is what makes it so relatable to know that you can celebrate that sort of moment, the walk on the beach or whatever it is, the s'mores at the end of your driveway. There are lots of celebrations that you can embrace. Yes. Yeah, that was my hope. 
<laughs> well, I it fed me. So thank mm. you. Now, I have two questions I always ask, um, and I think I forgot to warn you. So let's That's see okay. how you do. The first right. question is, every episode ends with a self-care task and then a family fun idea so that when moms are done listening, they have a way to connect with themselves and then connect and enjoy their family. Mm. Uh, well, I'll speak for myself. I'm a big bath girl. Yay! <laughs> So that is my favorite self-care, um, it, you know, in addition to the practices in the book I mentioned around savoring and some mm -hmm. of those more cerebral self-care things, um, uh, I think, in expressing Thanksgiving, I think purely physical, I, uh, baths are my go-to, uh, kind of my unwind exclamation point at the end of the day. <laughs> is there a way you take your bath? I, I don't make it too fancy. Occasionally I do, but I find if I make the standard too uh, laborious, uh -huh. then it won't, it won't happen. Keep the bar um, low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I'll watch something or read something uh -huh. if I'm really enjoying my book. Um, I do like it hot. Um, <laughs> that's one, that's one requirement. There's nothing worse than a lukewarm bath. I agree. Um, but yeah, I keep it pretty simple. That's fantastic. And how are you having fun as a family? What's something that yes. you're enjoying so one, right now? This one might need to be adaptable depending on where you live in the country, but a through line in the book is looking for sea glass. Um, and that is something my family and I have practiced probably at least four to five times a week. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And it just gets us outside. We're together. We're celebrating each piece that we find. Um, my son always likes, you know, he's learned what colors are more rare than others. And so he That's gets so cool. really excited about the rare finds. But it's such a metaphor for what we're talking about, right? Like yeah. we've gotten better at finding them um, because our eyes are, are trained. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we know what we're looking for. Um, and I think when you train your eyes to see delight, mm -hmm. your brain starts to, to see it more easily. Um, and so whether that's sea glass or a certain kind of rock on a hike yeah. or, you know, I think there's lots of versions that you yep, could Yep, we look for them. hearts when we go on there family go. walks, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. And, and we collect them in different colored coordinated jars. So all our green pieces go in one jar, blue and brown and white and et cetera. And this is a practice that started as a way of entertaining my boys during the pandemic. Bravo. But it's taken on a life of its own. And when I look at those jars, I see the way that God has woven friendship and community and laughter into our family. And that daily digging for delight becomes the fingerprints of God's faithfulness um, in, in your story as you reflect back. And so I think there's something about the collecting yeah. that's really important too. Um, so anything you can look for and collect that brings you delight. I, I really enjoy this conversation. My client one time told me that her dad had a pencil sketch of a laughing Jesus in his office. And it caught her attention because it was it ran so counter to <laughs> what she was taught. Um, and so one of my hopes after you read this book is that that will be a more familiar part of Christ's character and and a more familiar part of your relationship with him, that he is close in in the light of our joy and we can interact deeply with him in that place. Well, thank you so much for this moment. And I hope that people find your book, message you about your book, and tell you what their favorite parts were so we can celebrate and increase joy with you. Thank you, friend. This was so fun. Now remember, you are exactly the right mom for your kid. I am so glad you're here on Earth. And if you're listening to this in real time, it's Military Spouse Appreciation Day today. It was Teacher Appreciation Week, Nurse Appreciation Week. And Sunday, May 8th is Mother's Day. 
And however that feels for you, I just want you to know that I'm so glad you're here on Earth. And I'm lucky to know you. I hope you have a really great day.